very first visit was at the age of 18. It came from my deceased grandfather. He was at the foot of the bed. He nodded to me and told me that I was not to worry about him being on the other side. At the time it was happening, I just thought, oh, mom's calling. And, of course, I realized that she could not be calling me because she had been dead for 11 years. The fact that someone tells you they communicated with Aunt Millie or Uncle Joe doesn't necessarily make it true. And even if millions of people say that, it doesn't make it true. And afterwards, he was gone. And when I woke up, I could still feel his presence, his essence tingling all around me, just as if somebody who was physically here had just touched me and hugged me and hold me and kissed me. And, and... The abiding myth that we will live on is the essential myth of our human personalities and of all of our cultures and civilizations. And the next day in the afternoon, my grandparents told me that he had died. I guess the first place he went after he left his body was to my bedroom. Many of us experience things, and science is denying that experience because it doesn't have the categories at the moment to measure. So I went down to 86 and Broadway to catch the subway to Midtown to work. And as I would pass people in the street and even in the subway station, I just I really wanted to tap people on the, on the shoulder and say, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. The love of my life, dead, gone eight years, showed up in my apartment. The whole essence of her being just went right through my body. And I don't know what to do with what happened. I feel like I should be screaming it out, that these people are really alive. Hey, maybe people do survive death. I'm not quite sure myself. But somebody who says there's no evidence, they simply don't know what's out there. About two weeks after his death, I woke up in bed and saw a light on somewhere else in the house. He was standing in the kitchen, just very vivid. And I said, Dad, we thought you were dead, and hugged him. Interesting night. Glad you're here. Judy Guggenheim is with us, the author of Hello from Heaven. We're talking about after-death communications. This is a subject that is just at an all-time high as far as interest is concerned. And as we get close to the year 2000, the subject's almost mainstream. We are conservatively estimating 50 million Americans have had an after-death communication. And the evidence is out there. Millions of Americans have reported something like after-death communication or witnessing of apparitions, that sort of thing. And so the question is, well, what's going on? That's a lot of people seeing something that doesn't fit within the, the current, at least scientific, understanding of the world. These experiences have probably been with us since the dawn of mankind. Toddlers have them, and will remark about great-grandma in the morning having visited her. Start, say with, say, with 50 million, and you start chopping them down, saying, well, okay, let's get rid of 90% of it. That leaves an awful lot of people with very credible stories. And now what's going on? I think there's a religious impulse in much of this, a kind of quasi-religious desire to verify the spiritual universe. After death communications, you still have time to call. Let's go back to Detroit. Well, this is hard to talk about. I left and went to Fort Knox, Kentucky in 1980. I joined the Army. I think that was the happiest thing I did for my dad. He was dying of lung cancer. The day he died, November 22nd, he showed up in front of me just as solid as I was looking at him. He said, son, I'm proud of you. You're going to do good. And when I went to lunch, my drill sergeant came up to me. He goes, or I got something to tell you. And I looked at him. I go, I know. My dad's dead. How many uh, times have you told this story? Twice. Yes. We've examined hundreds and thousands of claims people make. Eyewitness testimony of things that they want to believe. I mean, you have reincarnation, you have abductions, uh, any number of wondrous things. So you, ha you have to carefully sort out testimony that people make. It may be deep felt, and surely 
life after death is a very important human interest. I mean, it's, uh, it's passionate, and there's a longing. There is what I call the transcendental temptation, a hankering after a world beyond. And so there is a natural propensity to believe, and here more than anywhere else. This is really is nothing new, this vehement attitude toward the possibility of survival. For example, in the 1600s, when Sir Isaac Newton proposed a radical idea called universal gravity, the skeptics went ballistic. They accused Newton of surrendering to mysticism. No one had ever been able to, to hold gravity in their hands. It was invisible. This sounded nuts. And so uh, this really went over in, in Newton's time, much like this idea of survival goes over in our time. From a physics point of view, we know that the energy doesn't go away. We know that the material body itself may crumble and, and, and turn into the, its constituent molecules and atoms, but it doesn't go away. It's all there. It's just it comes into a different form. And so it's not that difficult to imagine that what we think of as ourselves, as, as the consciousness of ourselves, turns into a different form because that's how everything else works as far as we know. I used to build these gadgets in my bedroom and one of the gadgets I built was a thing they call a cloud chamber which is a device for tracking subatomic particles. It, there's a misty vapor and the particle can be seen in the vapor and the, the powerful thing about a cloud chamber is that there's nothing, there's just the vapor and then suddenly there's a track going across and then it disappears into nothing again. And when my baby was born, I remember that at the moment of her birth, that here there was nothing. Now there's this baby. And she was like the track going across the cloud chamber. And then one day she will just disappear again. But you see that you know from the cloud chamber that the subatomic particle isn't dying, like we think. It's just simply going back into the quantum vacuum, back into the ground of being. So it comes out of the ground of being, it traverses at this level sometimes, and then it goes back to the ground of being. And I think it's impossible to see something like that and not have it affect your ideas of life and death. We now know that the, the world is described by fundamental physics, mainly quantum mechanics, is strange enough to allow these weird interconnections between people's minds and the environment. That's the quantum interconnectedness that the physicists talk about. The world of the physical is strange enough to allow this. So it is no longer inconceivable that the forms of interconnection that the mediums talk about and that some psychics talk about is in fact a reflection of the way the world really is. And suddenly, I've had a feeling of my mother's presence that was so strong, it was as if she'd come up and put her arms around me and give me a great big hug. And about six feet away, this chair was against the wall and Paul appeared. He said he was sitting on the chair. He was about eight years old. Two years after Karen died, I saw her and it was like this joyous reunion. It was like, oh my goodness. And she comes out and she hugged me and said, oh, Mom, it is so good to see you. I looked in the doorway, and there he was, standing, you know, and he says, I'm not going to hurt you. He said, I just wanted to see you, you know, and with that, he faded out of the doorway. I was a nervous wreck. I just know, you know, that this was not some self-appeasing um, fantasy of mine, but from some other person's consciousness, some other area of experience, not my own at all. I think that they are around us just in another form. You know, they're, they're here, you know. They're with us all the time. I think that the evidence is so strong that we can predict where this is going to wind up. The idea of the survival of something one day is going to be good, solid science. And the people who don't believe in this are going to be viewed as uh, cranks and deviants. <laughs> it is impossible for the human mind to conceive of a time when it no longer exists, when consciousness does not exist. So we invent all kinds of scenarios to believe 
that something of awareness will still go on when we are dead. There's a biological necessity for every single-celled organism to stay alive so that it can reproduce its DNA. That's what drives all of evolution. As soon as we get to an organism like ourselves, which is a thinking, processing organism with a psychology, we transmute the biological necessity to stay alive into a psychological necessity to stay alive. So we create this entire mythology about what happens after Aunt Marge is theoretically dead. She stays alive, which is a way of reassuring each of us that we ourselves are going to do the same thing and always be alive. Our obsession with needing to believe that there is something after death has been magnified by modern technological medicine. A couple of generations ago, when people died at home, we watched the reality of death. Death is a process. Death is not an acute event. We would watch events unfurl, as it were, until finally that person died. It was a natural phenomenon. It was expected. It was understood. There was a lot of experience with it because so many more people died and died at home right in front of us. Now what happens is someone is torn away from us, secreted away, hidden away in a hospital environment. We don't see any of the natural unfolding. And at a given moment, a young physician comes out and says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your mother has just passed on, or whatever euphemism they use. But there's got to be more. There's, there's a need to hold on to that person. There's a need to see a continuity that this has not ended so abruptly. And I think that adds to the entire mix, and it's one of the reasons for this huge explosion in people's seeking out that something else, seeking out the extra days and weeks of what you might call post-death life. My beloved Aunt Cornelia died in January of 1994. That was about three months before I finished my first novel. And so I wrote a dedication to her because she was precious. And the last line of the dedication was, she is eternal. And as soon as I wrote those words, I felt a kiss right here. And I gasped and I cried. And it, it confirmed for me that she was still there loving me and that she was still there for me and supporting me and believing in me. It was, it was the most beautiful experience to have happen. My father died in 1975, and three months after his death, my mother and I were standing in, in his room when we felt a, a breeze of air just blow us by, and all the windows in the house were closed, and it was really cool, and um, I, I, I could smell his cologne, food to his aquavalva. And uh, I tell my mom, that's my dad, you know. In 1971, my only brother passed away from cancer. And about three months after he passed away, he woke me up in the middle of the night. And uh, he was at my doorway, standing regular, with clothes on, with a, a background behind him, a little like a yellowish background behind him. And he said, I just want to let you know that I'm OK. I knew it actually happened. I knew it wasn't a dream. Have I ever had an after-death communication? Of course I have. My mother died when I was 11, and I would communicate with my mother. I knew that this was not real, and I also knew, even at the age of 11, that I had to do it. I had to keep her alive in some way, because I couldn't let her go. That's a very different thing, though, than people who honestly believe that that person they're communicating with exists in some intellectual or spiritual form and that the communication is true.
think about the kind of things that happen that make us think there might be survival of consciousness. You could roughly divide them into two classes of things that just happen without any intermediaries to people. The apparitions, the dreams, the, the sense of presence, things like that. And then there's the things that are literally mediated by people who call themselves mediums. Now, there is a male who is coming through who I see is filling up with fluids, which means he either passed from pneumonia or he had some type of congestive heart failure. Do you understand that? That would probably be my father. Now, what's a medium? It's a person who thinks that somehow they can contact to see spirits. Now, I say somehow because that's about as precise as we can get at this point. I can feel his presence. I just can't hear him. But I can yeah, feel he him. couldn't. He had a tracheotomy. We could call it, say, telepathy, okay? If telepathy is mind-to-mind -mind communication and a mind survives death, then supposedly the mind of the medium could telepathically communicate with the mind of the spirit. And that sounds like we're getting more precise. But while we know that telepathy occurs, we don't understand it. It's not mind reading. It is tele telepathic. It's a telepathic communication between the soul of the other side and me. And it's during that exercise, that telepathic bridge that's created, that I will clairvoyantly, clairaudiently, clairsentiently be able to interpret the symbology of what's coming through. Who had the chicken running in the backyard? This is connected to Anna or Anthony. My grandmother, who was Anna, her sister had a chicken farm in Long Island. Oh, I think that might be significant. How many else had chicken farms in Long Island? I think that, uh, quote, a good medium I don't think there is such a thing. But some people are skilled because they've interact with people and they give a kind of psychological counseling and they can read the expression of the person and to give back responses that may work better than others. Because your mom is coming through. She's showing me pink roses. When I see pink roses, it's their way of expressing their love to you. She's passing this on to you. I also see a white flower coming up in June. So that to me means that there's a celebration or a birthday either in the sixth month. Do you understand that? It's my birthday. Happy birthday from your mom. But this is a kind of psychological interaction, interpretation, and not communication with the dead beyond. He's not going to talk about a dress. This dress has some type of specific connection to her. Either you have her dress and you were smelling it, but she's telling me to talk about some type of clothing issue, and I feel like, you're, I feel like I'm smelling it. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay, she's telling me she was with you when you were doing this? When he was talking about smelling an article of clothing, I was actually doing that. I was smelling my mother's robe maybe a month ago. And you tend to remember the hits. A medium may give you 20 responses to a question. And that medium may be wrong on 18. Are you one of three? No. How many? Ah, but the two he got. He said that my brother had lung cancer, and he did. Okay. Is your sister older? Younger. Has her mother passed? No. Your mom's mom is here? Yeah. But the dates were wrong, the places were wrong, and many other things were wrong. So I don't know if you're contemplating having a child. No. Okay. But people are so eager to think that there's contact with the dead that they focus on the hit that he or she may have gotten. My field has a bullseye on it, and people are constantly trying to shoot us down. So I try to be as specific as I can so that people have to say, well, you know, such and such could have been a, a general thing. But what about this? Now, somebody, again, has a very weird... This is like the weird name corner. Somebody has a weird name that sounds like Inky or Pinky. My son. What's the name? No, we call him Binky. Binky. Belief in an afterlife gives consolation to people. Before, I was going to, with the bee, the crazy bee sound you mentioned. It gives them a, a kind of crutch to lean on to get through adversity. So I would attribute this to a deep felt... It gives them a, a kind of crutch to lean on to get through adversity. So I would attribute this to a deep felt psychological expression of a hunger, a desire, a need. That, but that doesn't make it so. Is there a running joke about some type of mooning thing? Sure is. Okay. <laughs> I totally believe that after death communications are part of our everyday life, whether it's avoiding a civil car accident and people say, oh my God, I saw my father's face and I avoided the accident or a simple message of love coming through in a visit, which is a dream, or the actual reading where the, the major validations come through to provide us with the evidence of, this is real. I think that the abiding myth that we will live on is the cradle of virtually all mythology. 
it's a universal and human experience. I think the notion that immortality is a, a con game the human mind is playing on itself is, is absolute nonsense. I think we have intimations of immortality, as Wordsworth put it, because we are immortal. American culture is so, what I call, spiritual dumb on the notion of death. Uh, and other cultures are so much more what I call spiritually intelligent. The fact that we make such an issue over it, is there scientific proof for some kind of survival of death, in many ways is specific to modern Western culture. A lot of traditional, indigenous, simpler sorts of cultures where religion sort of permeated the fabric of everyday life wouldn't see this as an issue. Not only were people taught to believe that in their religious upbringing, but a lot of apparent psychic phenomena happened that seemed to approve it. People would dream of the dead, and obviously they had received a communication from a loved one, you know. And the emphasis was on what did the communication tell you, not on is it possible for people to communicate. My grandmother passed on, and I feel her, and I see her, and I know she'll be with me for, for a long time. Unlike Western belief, I, I don't need proof that there is an afterlife. I, I live it, and I've lived it all my life, and I, I know that there is a connection. I was raised in, in Santeria and the Afro-Cuban um, heritage. My Afro-Cuban heritage has helped me um, understand that um, communication with um, the afterlife is a, is, a natural, is a natural occurrence, and it's something that just happens naturally. It's like taking a walk, actually. When the, the topic of survival of consciousness comes to mind, there's immediately a paradox also comes to mind. From the general population point of view, everyone is interested, vitally interested in this question. And so you would think there would be a lot known about this. Not only from, from an experiential point of view, of course there are a lot of stories, but from a scientific point of view, because science is very good at studying difficult problems. But the fact is that there isn't very much that's known scientifically. I think the big reason that most scientists don't even know you could investigate survival of consciousness, much less actually look at it. They're psychologically very ambivalent or afraid about opening up that box of what's the meaning of my life. Suppose they didn't find any. So it's better to push the whole thing aside, say there's nothing to find. We know quite well how to study these things. Uh, it's just going to take a long time because we have, a, we have kind of a problem here. We're studying, does consciousness survive? Okay, that's a good question. Well, let's begin by saying, what is consciousness? We don't know. So maybe someday when we figure out what consciousness is, we'll be able to study whether it survives. But until then, it's going to be a giant guessing game. We should have hundreds or thousands of scientists with the most with the greatest psychological sophistication studying hundreds of mediums to really get at this. But now the real question I would ask is, do we leap in and do we allow an act of faith to say this is true when it is not sufficiently or objectively supported? And the skeptic would say, no, don't deceive yourself. What we're about to do tomorrow is uh, never been brought and done in the history of science. And it has never been the case before that a group of pioneering mediums are teaming together with a group of scientists in a university that really believes in the idea that any important question that is meaningful for people should be asked in an open fashion. Tomorrow we are going to have a marathon. In the morning we are going to do the naturalistic experiment. It is a mediumship demonstration experiment. Demonstration means we are not addressing the how it works. We are addressing to what extent does it, quote, work. Okay, this is what we're going to do first. We're going to put a cap on you that has 19 electrodes. During the experiment, we will be recording your electrocardiogram, your heart waves, and your electroencephalogram, or your brain waves. What is that? It increases the conductivity. These data might tell us something about how a medium's heart and brain are connecting with the sitters during a reading. I'm going to insert 
with a blunt needle, some gel through. My name is Patricia Price. I'm from uh, approximately 30 miles west of Phoenix. It's a small community, mostly cotton farmers. Are you ready? Okay. No, I don't feel like a guinea pig, not at all. I don't. Uh, like I said, I'm very excited. This is an opportunity. This is the very first time, yes. And I'm very, actually, I'm quite proud to be part of this research, so. For some time between 10 and 15 minutes, you and this person will sit together, and you will do whatever you do in your own way. Don't start doing anything yet, because we have to... We've added the these controls to the experiment. We've ensured that you and the subject have never met. There will be no eye contact, so a screen will separate you. The sitter will give you only yes or no answers. You will share no information with the other mediums. Don't share a word of anything until the entire thing is over. Now, during the reading, the sitter will make subjective judgments rating the extent to which they personally feel that you are making a recognizable contact with a specific deceased loved one. Before we start, I want you to understand real clearly how I work, okay? Okay. Uh, you've never done this before? No. Okay, then we're fine. Um, okay, two things. I have to tell you just very, 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 very fast here. Uh, I'm getting a couple people around you very, very strong. Your papa's gone, please. Your papa? Yes. Your father, papa's father. Father's been gone some time, they tell me, um, Patricia. And I don't know why, but your father gave you your name because he says, I gave her my name. I gave her my name. Okay, what's going to happen is there will be a series of impressions, pictures, and words, and things that make no sense to me come through in my mind. I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing, hearing, and feeling, and basically ask you to confirm and verify it simply by yeses and noes. Okay. Okay, um, the first thing that's coming through is to tell me to talk about a male figure to your side. A male figure to your side would be a husband or a brother who has crossed over. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay, actually there's two, there's three. There's three. They're showing me one seems to be like a husband figure to you. Do you understand that? Whatever I say to you, just acknowledge with yes, no, or that you understand only. Also, who you least expect may show up along with who you hope will. It doesn't matter how close you were to them, how long ago they passed on, or whatever. Okay, well, first of all, a male presence around you. Uh, they talk about the younger male that passed. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay, because whoever he is is claiming he was the first one in the room, so I guess he wants the credit of coming first. Uh, okay, uh, as I'm uh, tuning myself with you now and I'm beginning to feel the touch of spirit, I see a woman that uh, she's very close to you from the world of spirit and has been for many years. Uh, she has particularly pretty eyes, rather large, wide set eyes, highly arched brows. <laughs> you will recognize my name, she may be so big, but not. How are you doing today? Doing terrific, thank you. I read by voice, so by hearing your, just your voice, not information, just your, your voice is, is enough. Um, do you have a grandfather in spirit? Yes. Okay, I will tell you that this person is a very, very strong man. He comes through with a lot of zest, a lot of energy, very strong. Started we have had quite a day today. Just to review what happened, there were six people that were listed as possible visitors. Every one of them was observed at least once. In addition to these six, at least once. In addition to these six, eight people and one dog <laughs> came through. I came in not expecting anything so there wouldn't be any disappointments. Uh, there were a lot of general aspects. Was your son killed in an accident? No. He also says beyond his control. Do you understand? No. Is that person still here? No. Is your mama still here, please? No, but I was very surprised at the specifics that I did receive from all five of the medium sittings. The mediums were virtually identical in their average performance. This graph shows the average ratings over the five mediums for each of the six deceased people that the sitter was expecting to possibly be there. The sun came through, you will see virtually a five, which meant every single person received information about the son. I would say the one that dominates this reading really is your son. Now, is this your son that's passed? Yes. Okay, because he's jumping up and down. My God, he's making me feel like you need to know 
that he is here. Now, I don't understand this, but your son also apologizes for his passing? Yes. He does take his own life, correct? Correct. Somebody passes that I feel is being like, boom. They go out, boom. It's like a big explosion, or there's some type of big boom that happens. Someone who passed out of the body very quickly, very The young boy who passed was a tremendous upset in the family, tremendous upset in the family. And I don't know if that's his um, initiation from it, but I do hear an M name. So that's his name or whoever he's connected to. This, the boy you're talking about is my son. And yes, I, he had taken his own life. And uh, he wished to be with his grandmother. Also, somebody just stated, Mom is here. Does that make sense? Yes. It is correct your mom has passed? Correct. Is your mother also passed over? Yes. Okay, your mother's coming in beautifully. But she also had a cough, a lot of coughing. <clears throat> she comes near me. I, I feel the, the um, irritation to the throat and the bronchial area. Also, another male presence comes forward to you and says, Dad is here. Is it correct? Your dad has passed? Correct. Okay. Your father also wore a hat. He's got a hat on today. He's actually quite a cute man. And your father smoked. I don't know if that's where he passed from, but he shows me the center of his chest. He's talking about some blackness to the chest, which to, to me would indicate either lung cancer or emphysema, some type of heavy respiratory problem filling up with fluids. I also want to tell you the other thing I got was a dog. I feel like there's a dog, and I want to tell you that I feel like the dog has wire hair. Does this make sense to you, yes or no? Yeah. There now is a dog who walked into the room. Oh, it was Mother's and Papa's dog. They gave me the dog that walked into the room. Did your husband have a dog who passed? Something about a dog. Something about a dog. God, I keep seeing that little dog again. <laughs> um, he just kind of keeps wandering in and out. The dog is back. The dog is back. Yes. The dog that you're inquiring to is a little dog by the name of... Pee-wee was a little chihuahua that lived to be 20 years old that I had to put to sleep last year. Preliminary analyses of the heart brain data indicate that the medium's brain is registering the subject's heart, while the medium's heart is disconnecting with the subject's heart. These findings are consistent with the hypothesis that during a reading, the medium is disconnecting from the sitter and possibly connecting with the deceased. This experiment does not tell us how this phenomenon occurs. What it does strongly suggest, to put it mildly, is that there is a phenomenon and that it can be replicated and that it has very deep significance. We hope this is a beginning, a new beginning for this work. five minutes into the history of this universe and therefore naturally we're only five minutes into our understanding of the universe only five minutes into our study of the universe there are far more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our very immature philosophy um, there's more to come there's more of us to come we're, we're, we're hardly the end of evolution's process Newton's universe was cold, dead, lifeless. It was just about brute matter, which was all law-abiding, determinate, predictable, controllable. There's no room in Newton's science at all for consciousness, for, for human feelings, human suffering, human joy. We just simply don't appear in Newton's equations. But there was a second scientific revolution in the 20th century where you get quantum mechanics, relativity theory, chaos, and complexity science. And quantum mechanics tells us we live in a participatory universe and that we human beings, we conscious creatures, are co-creative insiders. So this is a radically different picture from the Newtonian picture, where we are just aliens on the edge of an alien reality. I can see from the physics that consciousness is part of the ground of being itself, part of the quantum vacuum. Consciousness is just written into the fabric of reality. And that's my consciousness and your consciousness and everybody else's consciousness. And we must have a deep sensitivity, loyalty, and almost gratitude that this life is part of a much larger process. my favorite uncle and he passed away last year 
and when we were driving to pick up my brother, we stopped behind the school bus, and when I looked out the window, I saw my Uncle Joe smiling at me. I was a little bit scared, but it made me happy. I think he was giving me a sign that he was okay, because I was worried about him. Many people have spontaneous communications with their loved ones in the spirit world. And although it may be only once in a, a person's lifetime, they are at that moment a medium. My brother Jack, he died after a long illness, and um, I was very upset about it. And um, But what was strange was that uh, my brother Jack came to Milt in a dream. We were walking down a dirt road. And Jack was not crippled. He walked straight as anybody and very normal. And we were just walking down this road, uh, carrying on a conversation. When all of a sudden he turns to me and he said, I want you to know that I'm happy and I am well. I realized that the reason that he did not come to me was because he needed to prove to Mill that there is life after death. I already knew that, so I, I had no doubts. Oh, it changed me perhaps a little bit. Maybe I, I lean a little bit more that way, but uh, if you were to ask me, I'd say, no, I don't believe. No. Unfolding one's mediumship uh, and refining that uh, takes constant dedication. It's an ongoing process. It isn't something you can do in a weekend or a week-long workshop. It uh, really encompasses one's whole life of dedication. This beautiful man is my father. And this is the way he looks to me when I visit him now. As a matter of fact, he said he wears this old body so I can recognize him. In order to reach him, I have to uh, leave everyday activities behind and make that physical effort and so I usually sit down in my comfortable chair and close my eyes and take some deep breaths as though I were about to meditate and I can feel a change it's not like just thinking about him but I can actually feel like it was when I was with him I can still smell his pipe tobacco I can still hear him call me sugar and baby Loved ones can immediately communicate with us, and we learn a lot from that, I believe. We learn, first of all, that uh, that love uh, does not cease when one goes on to the other world. Well, my father was living in Los Angeles, and I was living in New York, and one night I was in bed, um, and I just had a very, very strong sense of, of him being in the room with me. I felt... Uh, just the way I feel when I'm with him. I felt his energy, his essence, his presence there, but his physical body, of course, wasn't there. And uh, the next day, I found out that he had died. The experiences that I've had have convinced me that we can all do this, and I feel that what stops us is fear. You're thought to be slightly touched, not intellectual, not sophisticated, not reasonable, not rational, if you believe that you could talk to your loved one who was in the world of spirit. So we shut it off. coming to this were, um, I didn't think it would be anywhere near as accurate as what happened to me. I have no control over who shows up, and if the people that you do want to hear from do come through, I have no promise that they're going to tell you what you're expecting to hear. Mm -hmm. I'm Tom Jack. Uh, I own a nightclub in Manhattan called Spiral Lounge. Um, the first thing that's being shown to me is a male figure who's crossed over, like a father-type figure, which may indicate that your dad has crossed over. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so your dad has passed. Yes. All right. Your dad is I was amazed he got off to it so quickly. Pointing to his chest. And at first I was like, like okay, this could be something. something. Like this is what causes his passing. There's like an explosion in the chest. Yeah, heart attack. Okay, because I feel like there's like a big explosion that happens here. He's telling me to let you know that he's okay. Some of the smaller things, you know, he said my father had an explosion in his chest. My father did die of a heart attack. I believe this is coming from your mom. Is she the one with the cancer? Yeah. Okay. Because she tells my me mother that. did die of cancer. I never told him that. He told me that. That the month of April has a meaning to her. It's my birthday. It's your birthday. Okay. 
What? Is she trying to tell me she passed by your birthday and that's a celebration? No. Now, she's also telling me to talk about being out of state or upstate. I don't feel like you're in the area that I would know you from. So, are you not from New York or is there No, a I'm not from New York. Okay. Now, do you have a sister? Yeah. Is she getting married? No. Is there a marriage that took place for her after your mom passed? Uh, yeah. Your mom's telling me that after her, pa after her passing, she went to yes. a wedding. Yes. She's telling me to tell her. Really? She was at the wedding. There was points where I had to just laugh because there's no way he could have known these things. Um, and there was other points where I really felt like I felt an energy in the room. I felt the presence of people in the room or, or not people, but I felt the presence of something in the room that wasn't there before we started. Now, is there another brother besides you? Yeah. Okay, because now she's telling me she's bringing her, your brother with her. She's bringing your brother through. Why is there so much green around him? Was he like in Ireland or Scotland? Where was it? <clears throat> no, it was in Canada, but it was in a rural area. He's showing me like green all around him. He is telling me to tell you that he is okay. I do want to tell you that I feel like his passing happens very, very fast. Um, it is at the hands of somebody else, though. You're aware of that? There was some mystery surrounding my brother's death. And again, this is a trauma to the head from what he shows me that causes his passing. Is that what they told the you? The police had said it was an accident. He'd been found on the side of a road. His body was very badly mutilated. Well, I'm getting it back here. As if he'd been run over many times, and that was the official explanation. I just have this, like, attack feeling. Like, there's, like, a riotous feeling around me. There, there is talk about this as being something that is unique and freaky, is my feeling, about how he passes. Um, and that there are unanswered questions. And then when he came through and said, your brother wants to tell you that the story that you've been told about his death isn't true. Is not what you know. And that you don't really have the opportunity to investigate it in the way that you want because you're stopped. I mean, like, literally, I feel like there's a cement wall that comes up and says, can't go there. Uh, I was totally shocked because you know, how would anybody know that? That was like 26 years ago. How would anybody know that there was even any mystery involved? That was in a different country at a different time. They're stepping back. When they step back, that's the way of, of cutting their ties with me. Just please. So me. I've taken away a lot from this, and it's, you know, you could say it was life changing. Two, two, three, three four, four, and one. Two. two people four, started coming through to me one, in 1987 two, from the other side, which I had no idea what that was or what was going on. But it was all information that was being validated by my clients about their dead relatives. I was basically born and raised in a small town called Glen Cove, New York, um, Irish and Italian descent. A very uh, clear experience for me was seeing what I refer to as my little old man friend. And this gentleman would come through, usually in my dreams, and um, he would tell me things. And then I would relate him to my family. But um, nobody ever said, oh, that's not happening, that's not possible, you can't do that. Nobody put a limitation on, on the ability. So I just started doing research and going to the local library and trying to learn as much about psychic phenomena, parapsychology, metaphysics. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized my entire life I had always been doing it. And it was just something that I thought we all did. Sing ah. <laughs> Sing ah again. Initially, I wanted to, you know, open a deli and do that. And then I strongly had a desire to go into healthcare, of which I did. I have two degrees, healthcare administration and business administration. And I really thought, okay, well, that's my... That's what I'm going to be. That's what I'm doing. And I would just phase the psychic stuff out, and I wouldn't do it anymore. It took until my mother's death in 1989 for me to realize firsthand, literally, how important it is to know that our friends and relatives are okay and that they're still with us. Okay, the first thing that's coming through is I have a male figure that's coming through, and I'm feeling this person is above you. Above you to me would be your father or father figure, a father-in-law. Do you understand that? Is your biological father passed? Yes. Okay. Is her Aunt Francis' husband passed? No. Aunt Frances has a male figure to her side who's passed, which to me is husband or brother. And she's telling me there's a change. My name's Ann Skelton. live in Freeport. I work at a restaurant. My name is Chris Skelton, and, uh, uh, and I work in the health field. They're telling me there's a child who's passed. They're telling me to talk to you about a child. I hope so. Okay, so you did lose a child? Yes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, because oh. they're telling me there's a child that's been coming through for you. And when Liz died, it ripped my heart out, and I need, I need, I wanted some kind of closure on it. I had read some books about it, and uh, I, I had to come and find out something, try and get some, some kind of message that she was okay. This is a very dominant feeling to me. My dominant feeling would indicate that this is masculine. Um, however, we can have a daughter coming through that's got a very strong energy attached to it. Well, one of the things when he, at first he was confused and said masculine because she was, she was 6'1". First thing on the scene is my feeling, kind of like... And this big burst of energy, like he said, it felt like she was 
bursting in on the scene, and that's just how she entered every room. You know, she burst in and took over the whole room. Was there a miscarriage or... No. no. There's, there's two children. There's two people younger than you coming through. No. They're, they're telling me, too, that there's two there. Not two of my children. They're telling... She's coming through with somebody to her side. That means to me that there is either a sibling to her or somebody that I would see directly on the same level as her who's passed. That's what's coming through. Yes. She's insisting. No, I, don't have, be, I never had another pregnancy. I'm telling you, you're going to be wrong. She's telling me that there was somebody directly to her side who was with her. Who had the vehicle accident? She did. Was it someone who passed with her in the car? Yes. So she died with somebody else? Yes. Okay. Would this person be on the same level as her? Age group, you mean yes. 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 I have to say this. I feel like they're siblings. I have this kind of connection to them. There's a very... They there's sort a, of felt that way. There's a bond that's between them. She was 16. She was traveling with a friend actually out in St. Louis in a car accident. Like I said, the girl who he referred to, who's, who's with Liz, died instantly in the accident. Liz survived for eight days out in St. Louis. So, she's pretty feisty, so I, I was going to say, I don't think she's like you. I don't really have to work too hard because she's being pretty insistent. Yeah. She's telling me to tell you D, which either means that there's a D connection to her living. You made a reference to a D she's really close to. I'm like, I think they're all our friends and who I would expect her to say hello to. It's like, no, there's no D. And like Diane, Donna, Denise. There's a DN connection, and I feel it close to me. So this is somebody that's close to her. So write that down. It's probably someone who's alive who she's just putting out a hello to. Of course, her brother's name, my son's name is Daniel, you know, but it's just, you know, while you're there, I guess, you know, your mind's racing through everything while you're talking to him or dealing with him. Now, did you have one picture of her in your wallet that you took out and then put in another one? Yes. Okay. She's telling me to tease you for doing that and that she liked the other picture better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Her hair was better than the other one. She's making me feel like she liked her hair was better than the other one. She's, she's laughing. She's excited. She's been memorialized on a wall. Somebody carved her name on the wall. She's up on a wall. Yep. Okay. She's thinking about being on the wall, and she's making me feel like there's gum near her. <laughs> yep. Because she's like, she's, she's not taking it really serious. She's like joking around saying like, I'm up on the wall near the gum. One night I was in, in a train station and uh, I was very scared and I was talking to my daughter and uh, I actually wrote her name on a wall in pen and uh, put a heart around it. And uh, he, he made a reference to that. He also made a reference to the gum. There was a whole bunch of gum underneath. <laughs> so, I mean, he was right on the money. She's trying to keep this light. It's her way of keeping her personality intact and making sure that you... You know that even though she's not physically with you, she's still spiritually connected to you. It's very important that you guys know this. It doesn't change anything. It's my daughter. But it's, a, it's a, you know, I mean, like, I, I believe before I came here that she was still with me, and I guess it just confirms that. She's there. That little handwriting on the wall <laughs> that uh, she... And I was really talking to her that night, you know? It was amazing. And he, he pulled that out of nowhere. That, that's... Nobody knew of that. So, I mean, it, it had to be. Um, I did have a death in my, my family. My husband died two years ago. And I was doing it partly out of journalistic curiosity and uh, partly out of a sense of kind of anger that there's people out there who sort of prey on people's mourning and bereavement issues because I know how hard it's been for me for two years and how vulnerable one is to any kind of comfort. Right. The first thing that's coming through is I'm getting a male figure to your side. A male figure to your side to me would be husband, brother, cousin, or friend. Mm -hmm. I'm Lynn Darling. I'm 46, and I'm a writer living in New York yeah. City. That's the energy that's coming through. Mm -hmm. Is there a husband or a sibling to you who's crossed over? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, they're showing me two, which would indicate that the second month, February, or the second of a month, or he's gone two years, but there's some type of two connection from what comes through. You aware of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is his mother passed? Because he's telling me to talk about the mother being with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. He shows me two. Is your mother also there? Mm -mm. Okay, he's got two mother figures that are with him, from what he's showing me. Okay, I don't know. Was he older than you? Yes, he was. He's I was very like... struck by how much my mind was cooperating the minute he said that Lee was in the room. I went in there, a nice, hard-boiled journalist, thinking, I'm here on behalf of all morning people. I'm not going to let this guy convince me my husband's in the room. And yet, halfway through, I'm going, oh, yes! That's him. That was me. That was that was our his grandfather. That would be what you're referring to. And I'm helping him. Was there a joke about you singing 
<laughs> no, I don't think so. No, seriously. Is there some type of reference? Like, did you guys go to, like, a high singing mass or something? In, I was kind of touched just by how how it touches one, the hope that it gives you, and, and how much you want it to be true. He's very specific with what, how he comes through. Like, You've he suspended doesn't... disbelief. You suspend it in a movie. You suspend it when you're reading a book. You suspend it in a situation like that. And here the stakes are in some ways much higher because you're not looking for artistic satisfaction out of something. You're looking for something you're, that is your heart's desire to talk to the person you can never, ever talk to again. Now, had this gentleman been married? Because he's talking about a wedding. The things he got right, he, he really got right, and they weren't cliched things. He knew, for instance, that there had been a wife before me and a family before me. Um, had he been, he'd been married prior? That he was considerably older than I was, that he had died of lung cancer. Now, who had lung cancer? Of course, they're they show me my mother. My mother passed from lung cancer. And they're talking about blackness to the chest. My husband had lung cancer. Okay. So he, died. he described two things that really hit home in a personal way. He talked about a, an object, which he described as a round object, that was quite old, had an antique feel to it. Uh, it's small. It's something that I can put my hands from when he's making me Could feel. Could be like a little pill box. Do you carry it? All the time. Okay. Would it have been his? It was his. Okay. That's why I carry it. Right. And in fact, I have a, a little silver engraved pill box that I keep my wedding ring in, and my daughter's tooth, for that matter. Um, and I keep it with me all the time. And it belonged to his father. There's some type of um, funny... <sighs> Bra issue he wants me to bring up for you. Bra issue? <laughs> I have no idea what that would be. Well, hold on. We're going to get into it. There's some type of connection. After he passed, he's telling me that you went into a quota store, some type of situation, basically contemplating purchasing something that I would look at as being like an undergarment that would be not characteristic of what you normally would wear uh -huh. or something that he reflected once and said, why don't you get this? <laughs> and he's telling me that... It was very funny because it made him sort of blush. Oh, how funny. <laughs> I had been in a lingerie shop, and I had, in fact, bought <laughs> lots of new underwear. He's telling me to talk about a younger male who's alive. It's younger than him, which has to be a son, son-in-law, nephew. He's who's acknowledging alive? this. He's telling me you know this. He's saying I know this? He's making me feel like she knows this. The more I thought about it, the more the misses started uh, entering. But he's telling me to talk about nine, which would indicate either the ninth month, September, or the ninth or nineteenth of a month, holding some type of meaning. There were dates that meant nothing, and references to anniversaries that meant nothing, and lots of relatives he mentioned that don't exist as far as I know. You know he has an answer to this, which is that they will, uh, somebody will, he was, this, that Lee was probably passing a message on to someone else, or if I look further, I'll find out that these things, in fact, exist. But the composite portrait I got was a very generalized one. Um, he's telling me to let you know that he's here and that he is okay. And he now, comes back and says, I'm okay? I mean, what does that mean, okay? He's dead. How okay is that? But he just, that's his way of I didn't find any consolation in the idea that Lee no. might be there. In fact, it's sort of disconcerting, and if you think about it, it kind of opens up more problems than it, than it solves. My husband's around, and he's not talking to me. Or at least he's only talking to me in the living room of this guy in, in, in Long Island. Now, does that mean I should be involved in some sort of post-mortem marital therapy? I mean, should I be dealing with the fact that he's not talking? Why isn't he talking to me? Did I see, was it something I said? Maybe he didn't like the lingerie. Maybe he's mad that I go out with other people. It, it, I don't think that's very consolatory, and I'm not sure I wanted him in the lingerie shop, for Christ's sake. You illuminated his life in a very big way. I feel like you brought him... My problem with the idea of, the, of a medium is that death is a very personal thing, and it's an incredibly, incredibly hard process, the process of accepting someone's death uh, believing it, having closure with it, and going on with your life, and still keeping that, that memory of the loved one evergreen in your mind. And to hear that he's sort of in the room watching me, you know, try on underwear, doesn't do a whole lot for that process. <sighs> this is tough. <laughs> My son Liko, he was playing with a dog's chain out in the yard, and somehow got tangled up in it, and... Um, wrapped it around his neck, and um, he passed over. Grief is an emotional reaction that is in response to the death of a loved one. And it can be a very intense experience for some people. Um, unlike a psychiatric disorder, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, so it resolves naturally and on its own. His spirit is still alive, and I see it. I see it 
daily. I see it when I need to. I see it when I ask for it. You know, and it gets me through the grief, gets me through, you know, what, what, the feeling alone, because I don't feel alone. As a psychiatrist, I would not use the term after death communication uh, because that implies a belief system which some people don't have. However, the experience of being contacted by a loved one is known to psychiatry and it is part of the normal grief reaction uh, for many people. All of us are always surrounded by spirits, but um, we don't pay attention. Maybe after a death, we are more apt to pay attention unconsciously and let them in. Part of normal grief is also um, sometimes uh, a heightened perception where people think they hear the voice of a loved one or they see a fleeting image or a glimpse of they, they think is their loved one. Um, uh, they may have dreams about the person who has just passed away. Those are all parts of, of the grief experience. I was in Bangkok uh, visiting a friend. I'd been away about a month. And the phone rang about 4 o'clock one morning. And it was my brother calling from Los Angeles to say that my sister had been found dead in her bed, probably suicide. Sister had been found dead in her bed, probably suicide. And. I went back to the guest house and was in a quandary what to do. It was hot. I, I hadn't observed the fact that she was dead yet, but I, I wanted to be with her. I didn't know what to do. I threw myself across the bed in the heat. And I heard a voice say, it's okay. I'm where I want to be. It was her voice. and. She was where she wanted to be. The perception of hearing a loved one's voice uh, is not a sign of mental illness. Mental illness would be perceiving or hearing things that are not related to the death of the loved one. This is Douglas um, in Greece, which is one of his favorite places, uh, on a boat. He loved boats. Well, my partner Doug and I were together for 20 years. Since his death two years ago, I have often felt his presence in my life and uh, at times of um, maximum unhappiness he has found ways to let me know he's around and I guess the first um, really startling one was uh, a few days after he died I woke at four in the morning again in one of those terrible low low places where you, you just it's like a panic you feel like you can't breathe you feel like if you can't see or speak to that person now that you're just not going to survive it, it's it's a I don't know how to explain it except to say it's like a panic feeling you can't get your breath and I was wandering around the apartment feeling sorry for myself when suddenly he did the thing he used to do when he wanted to really kind of tease me and bring me out of a bad mood he, he took his hand and went down my back like this just as if he was standing there it was a real hand and a real thumb and when he hit the bottom of my sweatshirt there was a loud popping crackle it felt as though he had broken through some kind of plane into this plane and then in the process of going back it made a a crack, a pop, and it was over, but I went from crying to laughing in just a few seconds. I can share with you a part of my own experience um, of having um, a dream about a friend um, who, um, actually a colleague who committed suicide, and I had um, a dream shortly after she died, which would fall under the category of an ADC. Um, and I was very taken aback by the dream. It was uh, very vivid, and um, she was on one side of our revolving door, and I was on the other side, and I was asking her to come back, uh, and she had no intention of coming back. Um, and the next day, I called a colleague of mine because I was concerned about myself and um, my own emotional stability. And he said, um, after I told him the dream, he said, You've had a privileged look at the other side. That was his response. When you finish your work on Earth, then you can finally go back home. Then you become butterfly. You shed your physical body that's a cocoon, and then you take off and go down to all the galaxies. 
and I can't wait for it. But the first day of my funeral, they have to celebrate. I'm gonna have a big party. You can even get drunk on whiskey sour and good red wine and celebrate that I'm finally able to take on. Everybody can smoke. Everybody can drink. Everybody can dance. Everybody can do anything they want. Then they can go home and cry if they want to. I will not look. Supposing, just imagine, that we pick up the New York Times tomorrow morning and, and there's this massive headline, Science Proves That Life Doesn't End With Death. What would it do to us? Um, I think that we're so used to this uh, terror of death and this clinging to this immediate life that it would take a long time to settle down because the change is subtle and profound. If we were convinced that immortality was a fact, it would take the pressure off. It would help us to escape this sense of desperation, that this is all there is. And I think that with this would come a feeling of serenity and peace and tranquility that would be translated into the world. I think we would be less inclined to be at each other's throats in this existence. It becomes a much more humane society across the board. And there, you don't need to struggle constantly for, uh, for the biggest power and the most toys because ultimately we're part of a very long continuum. And this is only seen as a snapshot. And while you're here during this snapshot, you should probably be kinder to people. My surmise about what will happen to me after I die is that my consciousness will indeed end, that no soul will ascend to heaven, that will, there will be no real communication between me and anybody who loved me. There are lots of times in life that I have predicted something and wished that I was going to be wrong, but none in which I more devoutly wish that I'm wrong than this one. fear about the process of becoming dead but not the process of being dead because that's just a translation or a transition to another existence i know that my son is alive i know it's not a hallucination he's just gone on to another place a place that i'll go that i'll see him again i will i know i will Uncle Joey is in heaven because he wouldn't have been smiling at me if he wasn't or he wouldn't have been happy. If you realize there's an after and that love is the vehicle that keeps us in touch, then that tells you, I think, a lot about what love is for in this life. And that love survives death. And I really believe it does. Especially when there's a strong love, it never dies. It never dies. And of course, I'm not afraid of death anymore either. I'm not afraid of it at all. I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm not in a hurry for it now because I've got too many interesting things going on. But I am uh, looking forward to it. And my mother's looking forward to seeing me too. I've learned that death and the grief is not an end to anything. It's just the beginning. I think that considering these questions is what makes us human is the definition of the human. This is what I mean by our, the fact that we are spiritually intelligent creatures. Human beings are defined as the creatures who ask ultimate questions. We need to know the meaning of things. We need to know why we are here. We need to know what it means that we are here. We need to know what it means that we are going to die. But the tragedy of the individual death aside, death is a part of the process of life. It's, it's a, another stage we go on to. 
And when you reframe human life like that, you see us as part of the context of the whole history of the universe. Our bodies are made out of stardust. Our minds follow the same laws and principles that bind the stars together. We're part of this wonderful cosmic drama. Death is part of the wonderful cosmic drama.